Welcome to our webcast on the basics of financial management for small community utilities. We're very happy that you've joined us today. This is an enhanced webcast in that we have trainers from two parts of the country. I'm your host, Bill Jiraki. And in the PowerPoint slides we're going to be showing you over the next hour or so, we have a number of embedded videos that uh, take on some of the tougher concepts of financial management. Your trainers today are Dan Banier and Tom Fishbaum. They both work for the affiliates of the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. And I'm Bill Jiraki, your host. Now let me introduce our trainers today. Dan Banier has, worked, has over 40 years of ex extensive first-hand working knowledge and experience in public works, maintenance and operations programs, capital improvement project management, utility and land use master plans, environmental regulation, budgetary and asset management, and various federal, state, and local government review processes. With an introduction like that, I don't think there's anything he can't do. He's a certified waterworks operator in the state of Washington as a level four water distribution manager and a level two cross-connection control specialist. Prior to joining RCAC, the Rural Community Assistance Corporation, in 2009, Dan was at the city of Monroe, Washington from 1991-2009, where he had the responsibility for water systems management, administration, budget, capital improvement, and other operational maintenance functions. Dan also represented the city on matters related to municipal authority, utility policy, land use activities, administration and training and safety and emergency response, water quality, cross connection control, intergovernmental relations, and customer service enhancement. Dan is a past board member of the American Water Works Association's Inland Empire and Pacific Northwest subsections and is still actively involved in that organization. Tom Fishbaugh is a water and wastewater operator certified in the state of Ohio for Class II facilities. He retired in 2004 from municipal government and came to work at RCAP, Great Lakes Rural Community Assistance Partnership. He brings that tremendous municipal uh, experience to this organization. He spent over 30 years operating and managing water and wastewater systems while employed by entities like the City of St. Mary's, Sandusky County, the Village of Republic, and the Northwestern Water and Sewer District. He was a village administrator in the Republic and was instrumental in guiding the village to construction of a new wastewater collection and treatment system. And just before starting with RCAP, Tom served as superintendent for the Northwestern Water and Sewer District, overseeing 18 employees and nearly 20,000 customers. Tom is a member of the Ohio RCAP Energy Efficiency Appraisal Team and is past president of the Ohio County Sanitary Engineers Association and the Ohio Water Environmental Environment Association. He also served on the board of directors for the Water Environment Federation National Organization, and he's a member of WEF and a life member of the American Water Works Association. And we're very happy to have both of these gentlemen with us today to present this, uh, this webinar. The Rural Community Assistance Partnership is a national organization that provides uh, information, technical assistance to small communities. This slide shows the organizations, how to contact them, and we hope that you'll learn more about uh, RCAP by uh, visiting the website www.rcap. Org. At this point, I'd like to turn the presentation over to our first presenter, who is Tom Fishbaugh from Great Lakes RCAP. Tom. Thanks, Bill. Good day, everybody. Uh, we're going to start off here with an overview of financial management with a uh, video from uh, Jim Hoff, the city manager in uh, uh, Banks, Oregon. I think that the premise that uh, the average of official uh, is mis mystified uh, by it, in some cases confounded by it, comes from the fact that the officials usually don't work in finance on a daily basis or in the operation of the utility on a daily basis. So when they're confronted with the facts, it can seem a little bit daunting uh, it would, if they don't really understand or don't have a lot of experience in doing it. All the more reason to have 
some education, some guidance, some just some backup for the average individual uh, to give them the confidence that what they're looking at is important, but that they can understand what they're looking at. During our webinar today, uh, we're going to cover several things on the responsibilities of the utilities governing board, the decision makers, and the management of the system. We're going to cover uh, establishing a framework of the system uh, for financial management, also known as policies and procedures. We'll cover planning for the system's financial future, things to on finances for operation, for maintenance, for debt, uh, emergency reserves, replacement, capital improvements. We're going to discuss budgeting and adopting of annual budgets and how, how they're used and the meaning of budgets and why. We're then going to talk about monitoring and the oversight. Are our financial policies working? Uh, do we need to make adjustments? And how do we monitor uh, our, our finances? And then to ensure accountability and integrity of our financial system. Uh, you know, where do we start with managing our financial systems? Uh, with that, then, uh, we have another uh, embedded video here by uh, Mr. Jiraki that's uh, going to give us a little bit on policies and procedures. At the outset of the manual, we talk about financial management policies. There are five of those. What I'd like to do is just take a moment to reflect on two of those policies and the points that are made within those two. The policies I want to talk about are the general policy and the accounting and cash management policy. So in the general policy, there's a reference to enterprise accounting. And the main point here is that we're running a business. The services that we're providing, or the goods that we're providing, in this case, water service or wastewater service, uh, or any other kind of utility service in the community, what we're providing usually has a price associated with that. And so we're running a business. And um, in the fund accounting system that governments use, uh, we really take a business-style approach to financial reporting and to the accounting of all financial transactions. The second thing I want to talk about is the accounting and cash management policy. Uh, the first point is about separation of duties. The point that's being made in the guidebook here is that you should make sure that when you are handling monies, you know, finan uh, financial transactions, reconciliation of records, uh, all of these things. Um, it talks about having different people taking on different tasks. Well, in a really tiny city, you may have one person who's doing all the clerk's work and all the treasury work. And basically, you have one person doing all financial management. In this case, what you want to do is think about having uh, the mayor and members of the city council more involved in overseeing the financial transactions. So where you can't have different people involved in different aspects of financial uh, entry and reporting, that kind of thing, you can have more oversight by the elected officials of those particular functions and therefore have a double check on the system. The other point I wanted to make is regarding the uh, financial procedures manual. The financial procedures manual uh, gives detail in what are the tasks involved in accounts receivable, accounts payable, what are the procedures for reconciliation of records, who does the financial reporting, what's contained in the financial report. All those things are in the financial procedures manual, kind of a step-by-step -step guide or checklist on how to handle financial transactions. That can be produced uh, with the help of your uh, certified public accountant and other people who are knowledgeable about financial management at the local level. I encourage you to enlist their help. I do want to point out in the blue box on this screen uh, the link there on the web for the uh, rcap.org. Uh, if you go to that link, we do have uh, samples of policies and some procedures. And uh, they're in a Word format, so you can download those and uh, customize them to your own utility uh, and fill in the blanks and reword it as you see fit. Uh, some of those policies and procedures that uh, we want to talk about are financial management policies, 
And these are some of the general policies. Uh, what is the purpose of, of our finances? What are we going to do with it? Uh, we're running enterprise funds. Where do the revenues go? Uh, when are we being audited? Uh, when's our fiscal year? Uh, different things like, like that. Uh, conflict of interest uh, policies. Uh, we're also going to talk about planning and oops, sorry about that. Planning and budgeting policies, long-term and short-term planning. Uh, when when will we need money? Uh, how, uh, how how have we uh, spread things out on our needs? And you know, can we finance things over a period of time? Um, we're going to also cover uh, or these also cover accounting and uh, cash management policies. Things of uh, did disbursement of funds and when are we paying and um, who makes the purchases and who authorized the, the payment? What's our system of accounts? Um, separation of duties, which Bill alluded to in the video, is very important. Some way to protect everybody involved with handling money in the finances. Um, a financial procedures manual, very important. I found out in my past. If somebody's gone, you know, what are the procedures that somebody else can follow? Uh, where are things being done? How are they being done? Who's responsible for what? Uh, what happens to the cash receipts when they come in? Uh, do you or do you not have a petty cash fund? Reporting, um, you know, monthly reports to the board, finance reports, uh, records retention, how long do you keep uh, the records on, on hand? How long do you have to keep them? Uh, purchasing policies and the requisition system. You know, do you have a limit of uh, the guys in the field can spend so much, or after a certain value, do you get quotes, or or does it have to be publicly bid? What are those policies and pertain to your state or your uh, locale? Uh, do the board of directors have to approve? Uh, what about emergency pur purchases? How are those going to be handled? How are you doing payroll, compensating employees? Uh, what's the time period uh, that they get paid for? When do they get paid? Uh, the pay periods, how often? What's their normal work week or their work day? All those things need to be spelled out in writing someplace. Uh, what do they need to report as time sheets or uh, time, is there a time clock? Or how's overtime hours handled? Uh, are they paid? Uh, paid for it or are they given comp time or some combination of both and, and how do you review the annual salaries and the employees uh, performance and review and, and uh, is there a compensation system based on the, uh, re the performance of the employee and, and how is that done. Financial procedures manual. Uh, what happens with accounts receivable? How are they handled? Where do they come in from? Um, accounts payable. How often do you pay bills? When's that being done? Who's authorizing it? Uh, when are the books and the balances and the accounts all reconciled? Do you balance with the bank? Uh, and who's doing this? Part of this kind of comes into that separation thing if you can figure out a system so that uh, not one person is doing everything. Um, financial reporting. Who are you reporting to? How often are you reporting? Uh, monthly to the board so they know where the finances are, what's going on. Uh, does the state require, your state require any financing or any reporting or to the IRS or anything along that line. The next, next step on our uh, framework for financial management is planning. And um, planning is sorely needed in a lot of small utilities. Uh, we don't do enough of it. And Bill's here again in a, a video. One of the forgotten parts of capital improvement planning is, is figuring out where the money's going to come from to implement the capital improvement plan. The idea of paying for a project after we have the projects identified is something that should be done um, as part of the planning process. 
For example, if we know that we're going to improve the water system by making a major investment in five years, have we thought about where the money will be in five years? Will it be in the form of a federal loan or a grant? Uh, would it be a state program of some sort that might provide some assistance in that? Are we going to save the money in advance and then spend it five years later? Every one of the capital improvement projects that we have within the plan should have its own financing strategy. And as you pull all those together and think about them, uh, you can then understand better what the overall burden is going to be on the ratepayers and when those burdens will need to be um, implemented. Many smaller systems uh, meet their financial needs for operation and for debt, but what about good maintenance and capital improvements, replacement emergency reserves? These things have to be planned for, and uh, it takes a little time and a little effort to do that planning. One of the things we want to talk about next is uh, capital improvement planning. Capital Improvements Plan, also known as the CIP for short, everybody's got to have their acronyms. Uh, it's, it's a written, written document that uh, is updated, um, kept on file that what improvements are we going to need in the future? Uh, how long is that future? When are we going to need them? Uh, when will they be undertaken? How much are they going to cost? And will we have the money? Or what financing options are available for these improvements? How are we going to pay for them? Who's going to pay for them? Capital improvement plan should cover at least the next 10 years. You may want to break it into a five year, you'll see in what we have in the next five years, and then what we have in 10 years. It's going to change next year when you review it. Uh, stuff's bound to happen, so it's uh, your planning and your outlook is going to change, but you need something as a plan as to, to what's happening and where you're going to go with it. Uh, some of the planning, too, you want to consider input from other people. You're going to need this operation staff. You're going to need finance person. You're going to need possibly a consulting engineer. Maybe even the public involved if you have a, a, a planning committee. Uh, things to consider. Will your current facilities reach the design capacity in the future? Uh, you know, are you at capacity? Are you near? Or do you have plenty of room? You don't need, and that's not an issue for a while. Uh, what new equipment or services are needed to meet the demand? Uh, not everybody's been growing recently, but we have done it in the past, and very good chance we can do it in the future. Uh, do you need to expand your uh, facility? Do you need to replace equipment? Is it wore out? Uh, do you provide new services? Uh, this in, would include billing systems and computers in the office. Uh, which equipment's going to require uh, major repair or rehab? Or what's going to need be be replaced in the next two years, five years, ten years? Uh, if you fail to do anything, uh, is that going to affect any uh, regulatory violations? Can you can you meet the limits? Are you providing any safe water? Or can you meet the discharge limits of the wastewater plant? Um, is your local regulatory agency uh, going to come down and enforce make some enforcement uh, issues that you need to handle? Uh, these are all things that also go into your planning. Uh, what's the most critical needs? Because you you can't do everything at once. You, you can't afford it. But if you break it down and look at it and, and take it step by step and have a plan, uh, prioritize your items. Um, how are you going to? How do those fit into the plan? What benefits do the improvements include to the system and the customers? Uh, you're going to have to sell it to the customers. What's the options for financing those improvements through your state agencies, through the rural community assistance partnership? Uh, RCAP can help a lot of times with the financing of some of the improvements. Which projects are you going to finance through the funds you have on hand, and which ones are you going to have to go outside and borrow money for? Uh, big decisions, depending on what you can finance out of your, out of your budget that you set aside. Uh, smaller systems. 
And how do financing options for the improvements relate to your budget? Are you putting some money back? Uh, are you accounting in your budget for these capital improvements and put money into, into reserves? One of the things we want to separate uh, capital improvements um, the needs from the projects. Again, I'll mention the short term and the long term. Um, and the separate schedules may be looking at uh, how you're going to finance them, whether they're local, uh, out of your local funds, or whether you're going to have to borrow the money. Um, is it the short term thing? Can we save money in two years to put this project in? Or are we going to have to go and uh, go out and finance it for a period of time? One thing you'll want to remember, don't finance anything longer than its useful life. There's no use paying for anything long after you've replaced it. Um, major capital improvements, large sums, uh, can be completed, probably going to have to borrow money to uh, the state agencies or out on, on the bond market. Uh, smaller projects, uh, you might be able to fund uh, out of your own funds or within a couple years of, of planning for that. Um, reserve accounts, a lot better than your operating accounts. Uh, you take money out of your operating, put it in reserve. It's dedicated. You put money in your operating uh, funds where you deposit your revenues, that money can be expended for operation and maintenance. A line item takes part of that out each year, puts it in debt service reserve. It's in a different fund. Uh, you got a special action to spend it. Uh, you're setting money back to pay your debt. You're setting money back for emergency reserves. You know what happens if? Do you have some money to pay those bills in an emergency? Major water line breaks. Uh, the water line from the water plant into the into the village or into the city. That mainline valve breaks. Do you have the money and resources to take care of it? Uh, reserve accounts, planned equipment repair and replacement reserve. One I see used a lot is we put money back uh, for 10 years. We're going to need X dollars to repaint our water tower. Uh, put that into a water tower reserve account. In 10 years, you'll have the money to do that. Uh, it's a lot easier than to coming up with uh, all that money at one time. So that's what those reserve accounts are for. Uh, you plan to repair or replace and rehab those uh, those facilities you have, those assets you have. A major capital improvement reserve account, those big items. Uh, if you can fund some of those big items, the startup costs, the planning, and design, out of your funds that you set aside. It saves you from borrowing until you go to construction. And then, then go out and borrow for, for the project, for the big capital improvement. How do we do all this? We do it with annual operate with annual budgets. Jim's gonna in his video is going to talk a little bit about uh, operating budgets. Full cost pricing of water service is the actual cost, so what it what it the, the true cost is to operate the water system. Once you've identified what it takes to operate the system completely and correctly, then you're able to make sure that you're complying with the act, but you're also able to make sure that you collect the right amount of revenue from the ratepayers in order to be able to continue to operate uh, the system in a very efficient and effective manner. Okay, uh, now that we've determined all of our costs of what it takes and our reserves in our operating budget, uh, we need to prepare a budget. Uh, to act as a guide or a roadmap, if you will, uh, of what we need and then how we're going to get it. So we need to uh, prepare a budget. You might take uh, into consideration the history uh, of what's gone on in the past, uh, expenses from the last two to three years. Five years would be better, but at least to get two or three to see what your history's been, where the money's been going. Your current debt service requirement, add that into your budget. Uh, any unplanned emergency expenses that occurred in the last several years, you need to address that item. You know, if you don't see that emergency 
don't include it into your normal operating expenses. Uh, this is not to be confused with our emergency reserve. Revenues from the customer's billings and, and other income, um, what's that been over the last couple of three years? Has it been declining? Uh, did it pick up? Did, you, did the community or the system lose uh, a large user? It's going to affect our revenue coming in. Uh, more so than our expenses. Uh, what's going to be our required reserve levels for the year? Uh, do we have enough money? Are we going to meet those reserves? Can we put that money back? Uh, we must also uh, look at those changes. Wages increase. Uh, you, do you need more staff? Do you need less staff? Uh, cost of materials and supplies. Uh, Currently, what's the cost of gasoline or, or oil going to do to your your budget uh, for uh, itself or getting the supplies? Uh, what's your utilities doing? Uh, hospitalization is always a good uh, issue, a concern with preparing a budget that changes. Uh, not every line item in your budget will change the same amount. Some may ch change. Uh, Couple three percent, some maybe ten or fifteen percent. Do we have, we have any change in our debt service? Uh, you know, is our debt does our payment go down or is it the same? Are we anticipating any new debt? We're going to have that new project. Uh, is that going to hit us this year? And how many years does that go on? What changes are going to happen in our revenue? Is there going to be a rate increase or was there a beginning of the year? Can we expect more revenue? Can we expect a little extra money on any fees? Um, like I said, did our customers increase, decline? How's that going to affect the revenue if it's coming in? Can we expect any transfers? Um, are we going to do a project? We can bring some money in from our reserves or to get the project done. Or um, do we have any, for, for fortunate, any grants or anything coming in to, to do a project? Uh, those all have to be accounted for in our budget. This is a form, a budget form. There's many you create your own, however you want to do it. Um, but if you can look, if you look at this, uh, this budget form has taken uh, three years. The act, actual, and in this case for 2009, the, the actual for 2010, and the current year, which was last year, uh, when this was produced, of 2011, what was budgeted. And it looks at, in column uh, column E and F, it looked at the, uh, the three-year difference. What is that difference between 2009 and what was budgeted for 2011? And gives us an idea of, of where we're at, not only on revenue, but on expenses. And in this case, it showed uh, on the uh, our revenues, which is up at the top, uh, it shows a 0.11 percent increase in revenue. Not much to talk about. Uh, down towards the uh, middle page, the lower middle, our operating expenses are projected to be a 5.7, almost 6 percent higher. Well, our revenue isn't covering that. 0.1 uh, percent versus 5.7. Uh, they're projecting this. This is budgeting. They're projecting an income loss of 21 percent. Um, that's quite quite heavy. Now we're not matching our budget, but it's a it's a tool we use to work on for our budget projection. In uh, table three, we have uh, the projected budget for 2012, and it's showing that. Our board saw this coming and decided that they would put in a 2.5% uh, increase in rates. So we've included that as extra income based on our three-year average, add 2.5% for uh, additional revenue that we can ex expect. Then you break down your operating and, and uh, expenses, uh, put the amount in one column, and what I kind of like about this form is it's set up and it's it allows you to make budget assumptions. This just says we're using the same as 2011, but uh, it was easy to put in that way. But you want to take each line, uh, line by line, and, and explain how you're coming up with your numbers. 
you know, is it based on a, a oil prices for delivery? Is it based on uh, expenses will go down because we're not producing as much? Or however you're coming up with those numbers, uh, that's that's a great way to put it in there to make those notations. The next table we have is our uh, uh, table four, which is going to show the projected cash flow state. You know, where is our cash going? So we've got a, a handle on that. Um, the table just says, you know, what do we project for our income or, or our loss for the year, uh, our depreciations, um, what we have going out for loans, uh, how much we're putting back in reserves, where's our money going. Um, basically it shows down here where we figure a lot of that out. Uh, our beginning cash balance and our ending cash balance, we're, our ending cash balance is going to be higher than our beginning and we're going to have some some money left. It's a positive cash flow. And that's a good thing. So uh, basically we've uh, we're, we're not losing money for that year. Uh, we've had enough to pay the bills. We can put our money, uh, some back in reserve. And uh, we met our goal and our responsibilities. Hooray. Uh, so that's my part of it uh, on the webinar. I got you this far to go through and uh, do some planning and budgeting. And, and now I'm going to turn it over to Dan uh, Adair. And uh, we'll see what Dan has to say on finishing our financial responsibilities.